Welcome back to RoboHub. This is Abate. Today I'm going to be talking about one of the most opaque industries in the world, the waste management industry. You know, the people who take your garbage and your recycling and they just make it disappear every week without really telling you what they're going to do with it. It's actually surprising to find out that a large portion of this industry is not automated, it's ran by people, and it's people working in these very uncomfortable conditions, and obviously they're very difficult to hire. So a company that's addressing this is Glacier, and they're using robotics to do some of this dirty work and also increase the efficiency of the recycling industry specifically. So joining me today is Arib Malik. He's a really cool guy, and um, he's one of the co-founders of Glacier. Welcome, Arib. Thank you so much for having me, Abate. Awesome, yeah. So before we dive into what Glacier is doing, I'd love to just get an overview of the recycling industry. Yeah, sure. I think I think the recycling and the waste industry is one of those spots that we as consumers you know, rely really heavily on, but most of us don't really know how it works. And that was certainly the case with uh, me before I started uh, working at Glacier. Um, it's pretty fascinating. It's a, it's a really big industry. There's a lot of players involved and there's a lot of money that kind of flows through behind the scenes. Um, I think something that people don't think about is we spend quite a bit of money every month having our trash and our recycling and our compost just magically disappear from our curbs, right? It's like many multiples mm-hmm. what we pay for our Netflix subscriptions. Um, it goes to it goes to the waste industry. Um, and the reason for that is because it, it's a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, generally speaking, I'll, I'll kind of run through at a high level. How does recycling work? Well, you as a consumer or you as a business, take your recycling bin out to the curb. That's kind of the end of your involvement. A truck comes over. These trucks are known as haulers in the industry. Um, they dump all of your bin into their truck and they drive around, collect all your neighbor's stuff and take it to a facility known as a materials recovery facility or a MRF uh, for short. Love the name MRF. Um, that MRF's job is to sort. So you put in a bunch of stuff into the bin. Uh, a lot of it wasn't recyclable because as a consumer, you might not know what is recyclable and what mm-hmm. isn't. Um, and then within the stuff that's actually recyclable, uh, it needs to be sorted apart because if you want to actually do something with those recyclable commodities, you need to sort the bottles apart from the cans, apart from the cardboard, et cetera. Um, this big sorting challenge is quite hard to do. Uh, we can dive more into how they do it because that's where our company focuses. Um, but to just give you the next steps and what happens is, you know, this MRF creates, for instance, a big pile of aluminum cans. What it does is then it condenses those cans into a cubic block known as a bale and sells these bales to what we call a reclaimer or a recycler who buys what they hope is just uh, one commodity, right? So for instance, aluminum, um, they take that and they do some process with it to turn it back into either more aluminum cans or some other material that can be produced from recycled aluminum. Um, That happens for plastics, that happens for cardboard, that happens for a bunch of different commodities. Um, And the reason this this is important is because that aluminum can and that plastic bottle, there's a lot of energy, a lot of potential energy kind of stored in that commodity. Um, And if you're producing something new, um, it's actually a lot more energy efficient to use that recycled commodity than to go mine for raw ore or get the petroleum for the new plastic bottle or whatever you might be doing. And so you actually get really big energy savings by using recycled commodities instead of using virgin stock. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of in, in the overview. Obviously, that that reclaimer or that recycler sells raw aluminum or raw plastic chips to some producer who makes new bottles or shirts or shoes or whatever whatever they need to make. Yeah. And does that energy saving that you get from recycling, does that also transfer into a lower overall cost than getting it from the virgin material? Yeah, absolutely. If you're a producer of um, aluminum cans, there are two ways you can produce it, right? You can either pay for the raw materials. Um, that's going to come in the form of aluminum. That aluminum that comes from the raw materials is going to have to pay for the mining and the shipping and, and everything that's involved, the, the you know distillation of the raw ore into actual aluminum everything that goes in that process versus you can buy aluminum from a recycler um, that comes from all they had to do is take a bunch of cans and melt them down and clean it up a little bit. Um, And so it's actually a lot cheaper because that recycler didn't spend as much time uh, or effort kind of getting those, that, that raw aluminum to you. So yeah, if we look at aluminum um, energy wise, a recycled aluminum can takes 97% less energy to produce than a virgin can. Um, I can't tell you exactly what that means uh, financially, but you can you can kind of imagine the cost savings that come along with that. 
Yeah, no, that's a massive difference. Um, and so when, you know, you mentioned aluminum, so there are definitely certain materials that are more valuable to the businesses who are going to be very incentivized at this point to actually invest in recycled materials mm -hmm. than other ones. Like what, what would be the hierarchy of the very valuable recyclable um, components and then the ones yeah. that maybe we recycle, but it's not as clear cut that there is a financial motive to do so? Yeah, that's a it's a really good question, and it's it's not a straightforward one, unfortunately. The easy hierarchy I can give you right now is that metals are supreme. Metals are great because with aluminum or steel, they're what we call infinitely recyclable, right? You can take a can, melt it down, shape it into a new can, put a drink in it, return it, melt it down, make it a new can, and go in circles forever. With something like plastic, or you know, we like to think of our plastics not as just plastic, but the actual type of plastic, the resin. So. PET, which is your uh, triangle one plastic, as we call it. Um, when you typically recycle plastic, you don't actually come back exactly where you start. You tend to what we call down cycle. And that's why you see a lot of companies selling shirts and shoes and bags that were once made from plastic bottles. Because you can actually take the plastic bottle, spin it down into a polyester fiber, and then sell that again. Um, but then when you recycle that bag, right, is there a market for that? And so this is what we call down cycling. Like we kind of go around in a circle, but we end up producing something that just cannot be recycled at the end of the day. Um, and so when you think about the hierarchy of commodities, yeah, like metals supreme, plastics are really valuable because there's a lot of demand for them. Um, paper is pretty solid. Cardboard right now, especially in the pandemic, they call it brown gold uh, because it's super valuable as well newspaper, office print, stuff like that starts to get less valuable. Glass is a really interesting one because it is infinitely recyclable, but it's also really heavy. And so if you have to drive a, a bunch of glass bottles from one facility to another, there's there's cost to that as well. Um, and so that's, that's kind of mixed. Um, a lot of facilities don't deal with glass. A lot of them do. It kind of depends on how close their, uh, their buyer is. Yeah. And would, I mean, would the glass be melted down and reformed or it would just be literally reused as it is by the same company that made it? Yeah. For the most part, it's going to be melted down and reformed because that's the, the process of a glass is similar to that of metal. If you melt it down, it can kind of just reshape. I would imagine there's a big push by people who are, they make canned soda mm -hmm. um, to use recyclable metal. Yeah. And so how does that motivation by these industries affect the recycling industry for specifically metal cans? Yeah, great question. So if you if you produce cans, let's say you're Coke, right? And you produce uh, aluminum cans uh, for you. You might not care about the, the recyclability and, and the green thumb aspect or you, you might. And either way, you have this kind of um, financial incentive, right? You say, I want to produce a bunch of cans. I'm actually willing to pay two cents extra per can to be green and sustainable because that's in our ESG guidelines it's a company, whatever. Um, either way, what you're looking at is, okay, cool. I can buy a can that's made from virgin material, or I can buy a can that's made from recycled material. Um, I said earlier that recycled material is cheaper, but the, the other trick there is that it's not cheaper if there's no recycled cans to buy, right? So if you are a aluminum can recycler and you don't have any cans coming in, well, you can't sell any out. And that reduction in supply is going to yield higher prices. Um, so if you're Coke and you're looking at those two options, you're going to go with whatever is cheaper um, minus that fudge factor for your ESG uh, kind of motivation. Um, but, you know, if we can get the recycled can to be more abundant and we can make it cheaper for that recycled can to turn into raw aluminum again, then Coke is all of a sudden, it doesn't really matter if they're green thumb or not, they're going to be incentivized to purchase recycled stock because it's cheaper. And that's kind of what the objective of the recycling industry is. And that's what the objective of my company, Glacier, is as well as can we manipulate the economics of recycling such that it doesn't really matter if you're you know, trying to do good by the planet or not. The financially smart thing to do is to buy recycled. Um, and that's, the, that's the, objective mm -hmm. that I, the objective I think we're all pushing towards. Yeah. Do you have any idea what the percentage of the actual goods, the cans that are being produced are being recycled? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. I think if I zoom into cans, I don't have that number off the top of my head. And I think one of the things that you and I will kind of unearth over the course of this conversation is there's not a lot of good data in this industry. Um, it might not surprise you, but when you throw your bottle into the recycling, then nobody's really tracking that bottle at that point. Um, and so there is some information out there, but it's not very robust. Um, what I can tell you is that uh, within the U.S., 
we recycle about 30% of our waste stream. So the other 70% is either non-recyclable um, or it is just never recovered. Um, mm -hmm. Estimates right now say that we could recycle up to 75%. So if you look at the amount of trash we generate per year, uh, that's 300 million tons within the U.S. 30% of that, that's about 100 million, is recycled or composted. Um, but that remaining, there's another 45% chunk that could be recycled or composted that is not being captured. Um, and that's obviously a big problem, right? And that's going to come to A, consumers not recycling properly, B, packaging being made in a way such that it's just not recyclable, see the markets not existing for certain types of recyclables. For instance, a plastic bag, in theory, yes, could be recycled, but uh, there's no market for it. And so all of these things kind of combine together to say, yeah, we have 45% of the waste stream that could be recycled that is not currently being captured. Um, yeah. How much of, you know, I'm sure the, the people who are putting stuff in the garbage can, in the recycling bins, they're not thinking that 70% of the stuff that they're putting in there is not recyclable. They're thinking it's maybe 90% and right. they, they threw in one thing that they're kind of iffy about. Right. Um, so how much of this is a just consumer error? How much of this is the, um, the problem of the packaging, the people who make the packaging that are somewhat misleading in whether or not it is recycling? Mm -hmm. And is this a, a sort of government initiative that needs to happen that actually changes this? Yeah. Um, I would I would say it's it, it's easy to blame the consumer here, but I would argue that it's really not the consumer's fault. I've been working in the recycling industry for three years now, and I still have trouble with like a yogurt container. I'm like, ah, like which bin does this go in? Um, and it's it's really hard to tell. And it, the problem is like it varies based on the individual packaging. It varies on where in the country you are. What does your local MRF actually accept and sort? All of these questions mm -hmm. kind of are very opaque. There's no clear answer. And so I, you can't really blame the consumer for this at this point. It's, it's such a hard problem to solve. No wonder they can't figure it out. Um, I think the biggest culprit right now is the fact that producers produce without thinking about the end of life of their product. So a lot of times you'll go to the grocery store and you'll get a thing, a, a package or whatever, and it'll be a combination, for instance, of multiple materials. Um, a great example of this is Tetra Pak. Tetra Pak is a ubiquitous box for holding liquids, orange juices, milk, whatever. Um, and Tetra Pak itself is made of several layers of different commodities. So you got paper, plastic, aluminum, all in the linings. And it does a great job preserving your drinks, but that material is super unrecoverable because how are you going to peel the plastic and the aluminum apart and then extract the aluminum, all of that sort of stuff, right? There are processes in place for this, but as a consumer, like you're not supposed to be able to do anything. And if you have to look at who's to blame there, well, couldn't you actually produce a container that is designed for good end of life if you are some juice manufacturer and you want to make sure that your juice carton does have a good place in the circular economy. Um, and unfortunately, to my original point, right? Like they don't care about this. Like what matters to them is being able to produce a lot, do it at a cheap price. And so they go with whatever makes the most sense. Um, again, dream of recycling is, can we make what makes the most sense of commodity that has perfect circularity involved? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the local MRFs, these are, are these, private institutions or these government institutions? Yeah, for the most part, they are privately owned. Uh, a couple of them are privately owned by public companies and about 10% are owned by municipalities. And, you know, one, one thing that you also mentioned earlier, there's like these different categories that you can take your recycled trash and put it into metals, plastics, etc. But mm -hmm. in a lot of people's homes, all you have is a single blue recycling bin that you throw everything into. Exactly. Um, yep. Yeah. So, and then is this, is this a part of the issue? Is this a, a government thing where they're not sending out the right bins to everybody's houses where they need to be able to sort it out individually by themselves? Yeah. It's a, that's a really fascinating question. It's, it's really hard to get good data on what would work here. So I'll give you a couple examples. A lot of facility, a lot of, a lot of communities around the country, they offer what we call dual stream recycling, where you actually have two recycling bins, right? And the typical way they divide that is containers. That's going to be your glass, plastic, cans, steel, whatever, and then paper, um, everything that's cardboard, mail, whatever. Um, and there's this concept known as dual stream recycling. It was actually a big thing back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, but it started to get phased out because they found that people, consumers, like didn't have the mental energy to do this. And they found that if we get everybody to dump everything into one bin, we'll at least capture all the stuff we care about, which is 
primarily metals and plastics, right? And so this change mm-hmm. went into, into place because it just made sense for, for an industry um, that didn't really have the, the strength to handle uh, this much kind of inbound. But what they ended up with is another problem where now everything's mixed together. Um, the, the other thing to think about is like, what, could, what, if, what if every consumer was responsible for like dividing everything into every individual commodity type? Um, obviously, I mean, you can hear that and be like, that sounds, that sounds tiring. Even I would say that sounds tiring because like I said before, like I still have trouble splitting a thing into the right, the right location, even with just two bins. Um, there are communities, very small communities that do this. There's a great one that you can read about uh, in Japan, where I think they have like 30 or 40 different things you have to sort your trash into. You carry your bag over to a little building and there's a guy in there who helps you sort it all apart. And like, yeah, that like works for purity's sake, but like how many people are actually going to do that versus just dump it all into the, the landfill? Like it, it's, a, it's a tricky trade-off to play with and we don't have a lot of good data to say which one really works better. You know, an interesting thing about the United States also, the, the scale of garbage is just significantly higher than a lot of other countries. Yeah, um, exactly. Partially because we're producing more garbage per person, also partially is a very big country. Um, yep. We yeah, are, what, we are by population, is- sorry, we are, we are by population, I think, 120th or so of the world, but we produce 40% of its trash. So we're a little bit skewed in our ratios there. Yeah. Yeah. What, what is the scale of the actual trash being uh, produced? Uh, do you know what it is per person? Um, yeah. So if we look at the U.S. again, we're looking at about 300 million uh, tons of trash per year. That's that's recyclable, compostable, captured, not captured, plus everything that should go to landfill. Um, of that 300 million, like I said, 30 percent, about 100 million is actually recycled or composted. Uh, if you just kind of take that into, you know, the population in the U.S., which I think came out to 330 million in 2021, uh, we're looking at about, uh, for a household of four, uh, you're looking at about one ton of recyclables not recycled every year. So every single house, a, a car's weight of, of stuff goes not recycled right now because we don't have the infrastructure uh, behind the scenes to actually handle it well. Um, and if you take that number to the top, you're looking at about three tons of stuff consumed three tons of recyclables that you consume uh, as a as a household um and some of that gets recycled yeah which is a mind-blowing number it's a in lot. terms of just how much <laughs> yeah it's a lot that you could be recapturing and reselling yeah definitely it's a lot to be recapturing it's a lot to think about like why do we consume so much um how are these other countries these other people around the world getting by without doing it <laughs> A um, lot, of, lot of questions that I raise and hopefully, you know, for the listeners now, they're like, that's raising some eyebrows. Like, oh my gosh, my house is producing three tons of recyclable stuff and only one of it's getting recovered. Um, so, yeah, yeah, though, definitely a certain portion of that would be um, businesses and um, other large industries that are also generating the waste, not just the only the households. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's certainly not just on the households. Obviously, this this number comes from you as a person. You know, you throw some stuff in your bin at home. Sometimes you go to Starbucks and you toss it into the street trash cans. All all that stuff kind of comes together. Um, but it's certainly uh, a problem no matter how you look at it. Agreed. Agreed. So, what is Glacier's approach to this problem? Yeah. So I talked a little bit about that MRF, right? Their job is to sort. Um, and the sorting, if you look at kind of the global picture of uh, recycling, uh, from our opinion, the sorting piece has the biggest value to add with the smallest amount of effort. And so it seems like there's a lot of wins to be had in this sorting piece. And the reason for this is twofold. One is being able to drive the cost of that sorting down will drive the cost of that material down. So we talked about that uh, Coke example. Um, if you can get the cost of the recycled can down, then you're going to be more incentivized as Coke to, to purchase recycled cans. And one of the big drivers of cost is going to be the sortation piece. Um, I will note that another big driver of cost, which we should not ignore right now, is freight, the transport of stuff from one position to the other, just driving tons and tons of trash around uh, obviously costs a lot. But if we're looking at that sorting problem, it is a big problem right now. And it's a problem that could use a lot of help. Um, so what we do at, uh, at, at Glacier is we make technology um, that helps that sortation process. Um, if you look inside one of these MRFs, you're going to see essentially two types of sorting processes. One I like to consider high quantity, low quality sortation. So they use machines using spinning disks or magnets or something kind of more uh, heavy metal, old school uh, technology um, that does a really good job processing a lot of stuff 
Um, and it can sort, for instance, big pieces of cardboard apart from small plastic bottles. Um, but I said low quality because at either end, the, the like high density or low density piece, for instance, you're going to see a lot of stuff that shouldn't have been there. For instance, if you're mm -hmm. trying to sort paper apart from everything else using a density sorter, you're going to end up with a lot of plastic film, plastic bags in the paper stream. So you have this quality that's that's a problem um, and similar mm -hmm. on the downside. Um, on the yeah. flip side, you and have... This is, yeah, go ahead. And sorry, this is without any um, additional computers processing. This is a completely mechanical approach exactly to yeah exactly these are completely mechanical approaches to sorting um they are getting slightly smarter but um they're it's it's pretty kind of blind as it stands today and then on the flip side there's the high quality low quantity uh sorting techniques what well, that technique is, is is people um people whose job it is to stand above conveyor belts and sort through what these machines did not get right, um, and also to sort through stuff to prevent the machines from getting hurt in the first place. You have a lot of people inside these facilities um, doing, and, and I think you do a great job, right? Like a person's eyes and a person's hands are fantastic um, in terms of doing this type of this type of task, but there's only so much a, a person can do. Um, the, the drawback there, of course, is that people are also very expensive. Um, and so if you're trying to drive the costs of this end output down, um, people's a really tricky option to pull on. Uh, the other tricky thing about that is that people are really hard to hire for these these roles. Um, as you might yeah. imagine, it's not necessarily a very desirable job. Um, we have spoke to several facilities uh, across the country and all of them echo the same uh, complaint is, is like, yeah, my people are like, it's really hard to get people to do this job. Uh, we talked to a facility up in uh, Michigan and they have a station or a facility that has 30 sorting stations available. In the last two years, the most people they had in the facility on a given day was 14. And so you're looking at a lot of facilities who just like cannot possibly fill all the spots they need. And because you have a high quantity, low quality machines running and you don't have enough high quality, low quantity people, uh, doing the QC, you end up producing low quality outputs. Uh, when you produce low quality output, you you sell it for less. The buyer has to do additional sorting. The end output that they produce is lower quality. Um, and so kind of everything is degraded by this, this sorting problem not being done efficiently and high quality enough. So let me sit back up yeah. to what does Glacier do because that was the original question. Um, what we do is we build robots. Uh, we use computer vision to look down at a conveyor belt inside one of these facilities and identify every single thing that's coming down that belt. Um, we can classify, basically, you know, recyclers think of commodities in a very specific way. And so we just know that code and say, that's PET, that's HTTP, that's an aluminum can, whatever it might be. Um, we can use computer vision to do that. And then we pass that information to a robotic sorting system that can then separate things on a belt, however it needs. Um, and so it's very dynamic, it's very adaptable, it's very easy to install inside these facilities. Um, and the idea is basically here's like a, an option that you as a facility can use if you're if you can't even hire these roles. Here's a way that you can actually drive the the costs of your operations down, and and we hope also the quality of your operations up. Yeah. So if you if you were to help us visualize what this system looks like, is it yeah. a conveyor belt with a camera on top and? two robot arms that are, you know, like, what exactly does it look like? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So I think the first thing you want to visualize is these facilities. Um, these facilities, they vary place to place, but generally speaking, you have several layers, several floors, and on each of those floors, there are conveyor belts. There are these big machines I talked about earlier that do some sort of sorting, a lot of loud noise, um, everything's kind of moving everywhere all at once, very chaotic, and I think very typically, you don't have a lot of space, right? These, these places are pretty tight. Like you walk around belt and there's people saying there, there's shoots over here to drop stuff in. Not a ton of space to, to add new equipment in, um, which is one of the tricks with working in these facilities, right? You can't just say, hey, like here's a 20 by 20 square or 20 foot by 20 foot machine um, that can come and like do your sorting. Cause like, they're like, well, how am I gonna fit that in? So imagine that space, you have some conveyor belt somewhere that's moving stuff along. Um, what we do is we basically build a machine that straddles that conveyor belt. Um, so without having to mm -hmm. do any retrofits or major retrofits to your facility, we just plop a machine right on top of your conveyor belt. Um, there's a camera that sits a little bit upstream of the, the robot um, and looks directly down at it, uses computer vision to, like I said, classify everything coming through. And the robot itself, uh, yeah, you actually you got the number, right? We do use two arms, um, but the idea is basically um, a, a series of robotic arms that can uh, basically respond to computer vision. Um, pick up items off the conveyor belt, 
move them to some location, whether that's a, a bin that they're collecting in or a chute that takes to another belt or a separate belt altogether, drive it to wherever they need to, uh, to drop this item. We drop the item there. Yeah. So, you know, and just thinking about this from, um, a robotics point of view, there are definitely a lot of challenges with, with trash. Mm -hmm. Um, they're random shapes and sizes and, um, maybe a little bit wet Uh potentially, like who knows. Right. Um, so how, how are you able to overcome that challenge of being able to pick up individual pieces and move it to individual containers or other belts? Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good question. And that is, that is one of the hardest problems that we have to deal with because you're absolutely right. I'll get to the wet piece later, but like, if you just imagine a plastic bottle, like just one plastic bottle, the same brand, same size, like there are a thousand ways that thing comes down the belt. Um, It can be crumpled in different ways. It can be filled with water or not. It can be obfuscated by some other material. And so you have this really hard challenge. um, And, and, you know, the roboticists on here will understand like pick and place is one of the holy grail challenges of robotics today. Um, And there are PhD programs dedicated to designing a gripper that can do as well as the human hand. Um, Our challenge, of course, is that we want to make something that's that's high ROI for these facilities um, and is is maintainable, right? If I build you a $500,000, you know, robotic arm um, that can only do, you know, three items a minute or three you know, 10 items a minute, that's not good enough for these facilities. Um, so how do we overcome it? it? It's it's a it's a development. I think it's definitely like a, a point of focus for our company. And one of the things that our engineers are working really hard on thinking about, right? Like how do you design end effectors that balance high throughput with the ability to successfully pick as much as possible? And we have a metric internally that we call our pick rates um, and getting that thing close to 100 is the dream. But if you look at uh, just technologies out there, like even the best robots aren't hitting 100% pick rate for items. Um, and that's something that we have to just deal with. Um, to the wetness piece, to the dirtiness piece, yeah, like that just makes it harder. Right? If you have a, a, a dirty bottle coming through, you can probably pick it up the first time, but that's going to clog up a lot of your components and that makes the reliability of your machine more difficult. So how do you pick an item that is dirty without causing issue to your machine or rather how do you design a machine that's easy to clean and easy to update parts when it gets too dirty um, that can sense when it's not picking well um, and alert the maintenance team. Hey, like, can you come clean my, you know, like gears or hose or whatever um, that needs to be clean because it's gotten gunky. Um, these are all challenges that I think are very accessible within robotics, um, but nobody's ever thought about these problems in the context of, of trash. And so the problems that we get to solve, uh, you know, on our own over here, which is pretty exciting, um, but uh, they're they're I think I think they're 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 doable, they're really achievable challenges, which is I think the exciting thing about being here. It doesn't nothing feels like it's uh, un unachievable in our current context. Yeah, and one benefit is that although you want to obviously maximize the amount of items that you pick up and drop off, um, you're really you're really maximizing for getting good ROI and being able to replicate what a person can do, but do it 24 seven, as opposed to eight hours a day and, and do it at scale. Yeah. So even if you say miss a water bottle, that just goes into your percentages and you factor that out. And maybe it's not the end of the world because right. a person could also yeah. just miss something or, um, yeah. Or, yeah. or worse off, not even be working because it's 6 PM. Yeah, or whatever. Definitely, definitely. Um, and that's one of the nice things about being in our space. You know, I think about my colleagues in the self-driving car space, and and if you're doing self-driving cars or a lot of these other robotics, like you are not allowed to make mistakes. That robot cannot fail. Um, and you spend a lot of effort kind of working on the point nine 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 nine, right? Um, mm-hmm. Whereas for us, like, yeah, it's fine if we stop at point nine eight. Like, it's it's like it's a very high ROI machine if we get to that point. So it's totally okay if we make these mistakes. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to focus on the bigger picture. We don't get caught up in the details and we can actually do is say, okay, cool. Like this machine works 98% efficiently. Like what else, what else does, does recycling need? What other robotics do we need to address here? How do we need to evolve this machine to handle uh, this install location or this commodity type or, or whatever it might be? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so also to back it up to the software side, there's also object detection and um, classification, putting this in, thing into groups. Um, is that, or are you able to leverage some open source uh, resources out there? Is this already a solved problem? Or is this another large challenge of your company? 
Yeah, it's it's a good question. I think generally we like to build things in house here. One of the things that is uh, unique about what we're building is it is a robot custom designed for the recycling industry. Um, a lot of times, what you can do is you can go take an off the shelf robotic system and just plop it into place and say, okay, like here's a here's a Delta robot. Um, I'm going to put it into this industry and I'm going to attach some you know basic processing software, but everything else kind of goes uh, pre written. Um, the problem with that is that those off the shelf robots, those kind of custom generic, or sorry, those generic robots, um, they tend not to hit the ROI marks that these facilities are looking for. And so we, our whole premise is if we build a custom robot, right? It's like from the ground up, this is designed to be optimal for these recycling facilities. Will they like it more? And the feedback we got really early on and we're, we continue to get is, is yes, like that is, that is a huge win for them because it's simpler, it's easier to maintain, it's easier to install all of this stuff. When it comes to the software, that also means we have to write it ourselves. Um, you can do some stuff off the shelf, um, but typically speaking, like if you if you want to customize it and make it very specific to a recycling facility, yeah, it does involve a lot of custom software to be written as well. Um, it's kind of fun. Uh, you get to solve challenges that are really unique. Like I said, a lot of people have solved problems for pick and place, but not a lot of people have thought about the, the specific issues that come inside the recycling space. Like we were talking about, what if a bottle is dirty? Like, what do you do about it? Um, and so, yeah, mm-hmm. custom software as well. Custom, it, it's, it's all it's all custom. And the idea is that if we can customize the machine, um, we can build a machine that these facilities are actually going to benefit from. That's ultimately our goal is to help them do their recycling and their sortation better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and then just to get a picture of the makeup of your team at Glacier. Yeah. Are you guys something like 50% software engineers, 50% also some hardware and ro- hardcore robotics people? Yeah, that sounds about right. I think that's that that's a pretty good split. Um, I would I would say like as founder, right? I was a software engineer before this, um, and if I look at uh, what I'm building today versus what I used to build, um, you need so many disciplines of engineering to make this work, right? We need CV engineers, generalist software engineers, firmware engineers, electrical engineers, kind of the whole the whole slew of engineering. And so yeah, we have a, a pretty broad spectrum. We're a small company, so everyone gets to kind of like stretch their wings and kind of explore into like different realms. Um, but yeah, I would say on the whole, we're we're kind of divided along the the, the software hardware line, like about fifty percent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so I also know your team just very recently came out of stealth mode, and you're definitely still very much a startup. Have you guys already started or are planning on soon? doing a pilot at a sorting facility um, and being able yeah. to test it out in real time? Yeah. So um, I can't name too many names, but we have done uh, two pilots already and we have a third one that's ongoing currently. Uh, and so we have put these machines out there. It's great to see them run. It's always so fun to just turn on our, our you know, nanny cams and be like, oh, look, like there's our robots sorting through recyclables. How cool. Um, and so, yeah, we, we, we have a couple of pilots uh, kind of underway. We're at a point as a company where the objective right now is basically refine this machine so it's uh, it's it's perfect, right? We we know that these customers like they don't understand why building this stuff is hard. They just want a machine that works, um, and so our objective is to get the machine to work so well that they don't even think about it, right? As a customer, you just want to be like, okay, cool, I'll buy this robot. You install it, and then you never think about it again. And we want to get to that point. So that's where a lot of the focus is right now um, in terms of in terms of what we're developing on the engineering side. So you've now, you've installed this system in a couple different places. Are there any key learnings that you've gathered from seeing this actually in place inside a, a, a customer's um, sorting facility and they're actually getting their hands on it and using it and now they're sitting there comparing this to what a person would be doing yeah. two months ago? Yeah, it's a, a really good question. I think from their perspective, right? Like, of course, they are going to compare this to a person and Robots and people are, they're, you know, analogs, but they operate very differently from each other. Um, as I kind of mm-hmm. mentioned earlier, like a, a person, our hands are so good. I've seen people pull a can out of a plastic cup before, right? And they take the can, they put it mm-hmm. in the can pile, they take the plastic cup, they put it in, like, robots never going to be able to do that, at least not not in, a, like, the next 10 years, right? That's not something we're trying to achieve. And so getting them to understand this difference, like, this is not a de facto replacement for your people. It is a sorting technology that helps you achieve better quality at lower cost. Like that's what we're promising. Um, if you look at the learnings we've we've made so far, I would say that these install locations, they are wildly different, right? You can't just make one robot that does one thing um, and put it into 
a, done, a, a dozen different locations because each install, the size of the belt, the, the amount of density on the belt, the commodities you're picking, where are you taking it to? All this stuff changes install to install. Um, and so one of the, the great things about robotics is you can you can program the software to be very dynamic, right? And you can say this, this hardware, it looks very similar to that hardware, but these robots are actually very different on the inside because of how they're configured, because of how they think based on the stuff that's coming out of the line. So being able to build technology that is dynamic enough to handle a wide variety of situations, I think is, is key to our success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and are there other robotics players in the recyclable industry? Yeah, there are a few. Um, there are a few that are maybe a couple of years older than us at this point. If you look at the market as a whole, it's it's definitely very nascent. A lot of the facilities we talk to have heard about these other recyclable, uh, sorry, these recycling robots. Um, and a lot of them are, are waiting for the time to be right, or they're waiting for uh, their next retrofit to fit them in. Um, but if you look at kind of the market as a whole, most facilities have heard about them, but have not installed a robot. Um, if you look kind of beyond the robots and like what else is going to happen to these facilities, uh, you step your, you step inside one of these facilities and you're going to be quick to see like, oh, there's like 15 optimizations we could do. Um, and so, you know, robots first, uh, you know, there's comp competitors, but there's a lot of space. And then beyond the robots, there's a ton of opportunity to just build out technology that helps these facilities and helps the recycling industry um, operate more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what's next at Glacier? What's next at Glacier? Will we take over the recycling industry and fix the world is, okay. is the end. <laughs> That's next. Um, what are we doing? So I kind of mentioned we have these two prototypes. Um, the objective technically is to get the machines to, to be as good as possible um, and then start getting them into more uh, you know, facilities across the country. Um, at that point, right, like once we get this machine down and we can actually just like, press the, the rocket ship button on it, um, get these things everywhere. My vision is that, you know, one arm of Glacier is this robot. And the question becomes, what else? What else can Glacier do with our status in the industry, with the technology we have, with the people we have in our team? How else can we positively impact how we as society handle our waste? Um, and there's a lot of opportunity there. There's, uh, there's a lot of ideas. There's a lot of things we need to vet out in the market. Um, but as I mentioned before, this industry is really big and it could definitely use a little bit of love from the tech industry. So we're hoping to kind mm -hmm. of get the robot up and running, let that kind of be an arm of the business and then focus on what comes next. How do we, how do we next improve our, uh, you know, ability to take stuff away from the landfills and get it back into the economy? Um, is it compost? Is it, is it data? Is, there's a whole, whole slew of things we could be going into. Um, we at mm -hmm. this company, we never call ourselves a, a robotics company. We consider ourselves a, recycling technology company. Um, and so what comes next is is whatever we can do best to help this industry along. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. What's a good way for people to follow up um, on Glacier and your progress? Yeah, so we're, we're working on our SEO, but if you, uh, if you go Google search us, you'll find our LinkedIn, our Twitter, all that sort of stuff, which we're obviously, uh, you know, posting on regularly um, with updates. Um, we also have a website, which is endwaste.io. Um, and so you can go over there to check out a little demo of the machine and kind of see uh, what it looks like, because I can't explain it well enough with my words. Um, but you can go take a look at what it looks like, see our open roles, all that sort of stuff. Thank you. Thank you for speaking with us. Of course, it was it was great. And it's, um, like I said, it's, it's very exciting to be sharing this information with people because I think everyone needs to know a little bit more about how recycling works.